I want to congratulate all the teachers here at this Neuroscience and Education Seminar. I think you will find it very exciting. I feel very honored to be allowed to participate even in this somewhat remote way. Please forgive me if I address you in English. Like many citizens of the United States, I have a serious limitation in my use of other languages. In recent years, it's become possible to study the human brain as it thinks and feels. This has important consequences for students and teachers in the educational system. We shape our brain as we learn, languages, arithmetic, and science. We shape it in a way which has vast consequences for our future learning. We change the connectivity between nerve cells or neurons, and we also change the white matter which connects them over remote different distances. It is so important that students and teachers learn how this takes place because it may motivate their learning. Motivation is crucial to learning. If the student knows, for example, that attention is necessary to learn and that he can bring his attention at will to what the learning requires, then he may make an effort to attend and thus improve the chances of his being able to recall the learning later. A recent literature on mindsets shows that students who believe that intelligence, for example, is based upon effort and that they can change their brain and even change their intelligence by sustained effort. They try much harder and do much better. So what the student believes about learning and how it takes place is an important consequences for their motivation to learn. It is also important for teachers to understand how learning takes place in the brain. Not only does it motivate their students, but it also helps the teachers to understand how to organize their material. Teachers need to know that retrieval is an important tool for increasing the strength of learning. And this has vast implications for the spacing of training and also for when we use tests to try to help the students reorganize their material. So there are many reasons why teachers need to know how the brain changes with learning. I was asked to give a specific example of where neuroscience can make a difference. I believe a best example is in the area of reading. For generations, teachers and supervisors, and even politicians argued over whether reading could best be taught by teaching the child carefully phonological decoding, that is to sound out words, or whether it's better to simply have good reading lessons that motivate them to read and learn more. Neuroimaging has found two different brain areas, one related to phonological learning and one related to chunking visual letters into a meaningful sequence. Surprisingly, the phonological learning can start much earlier than the visual chunking. So we can teach people to sound out words and they can be good decoders but not be able to read with pleasure because they are not able to read easily. The visual word form area helps with that task. And so the task of the teacher is to organize the phonological and the visual word form learning in a way which maximizes the student's benefits. Not only have we learned that reading depends upon important and separate areas of the brain, but also it depends upon wiring up the connections between these areas. 
And we're beginning to understand that a very important aspect of learning is changing the wiring of the brain by increasing the myelination between parts of the brain that are active in a given task. I believe this is a place where neuroscience and educators can work together to develop the very best methods of teaching children who have difficulties in learning to read to do so. Well, I'm hoping that this brief introduction will help you take advantage of the many classes and lessons which will be taught during this symposium and be able to return to your students with greater motivation and also greater knowledge. Thank you very much for listening.